Hi, my name is Shira Rubinoff. I'm here with Clay Moody, Senior Director, Security Research at SecureWorks. Clay, such a pleasure to be with you here today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. So Clay, today we're gonna to talk about exploring detections and the threat detection lifecycle. And that is a topic that all organizations are pretty much dealing with today and different aspects of it. And I'm really happy that we have you here today to really get into the nuts and bolts of it and explain it to our audience about what you deal with, how you deal with, and really explaining it from the ground up. So to that note, can you please describe to our audience what a countermeasure is and what is the complexity involved with it? Sure. A countermeasure is any type of system or activity or process that you have in place that can take an action in opposition to uh, something that's happening on your system. It could be a detection capability with, that generates an alert, or it could be a block or a deny or disrupt some type of action um, that is happening on your system. So um, that, that's what a countermeasure is. And what does it take to build one? Uh, it all depends on what type of event you are trying to uh, counter. But um, we, if, it's a, if it's something you just want to log or detect, you would have to um, you know, create it in some type of research environment where you understand uh, what you want to look at and you build it and you look at that result that occurs from the countermeasure and you decide if that is what you want to happen, if, if it's a true positive or if it's a true negative, meaning that it didn't catch what it was supposed to, or it could be a false positive, meaning that it fired um, for something it was not supposed to detect. And so there's a lot of interactive kind of back and forth where you tune a uh, countermeasure to make sure that it is um, as properly executing as you intended it to be. So determining the value of a countermeasure, that is something also organizations struggle with. You know, there's a lot to deal with when it comes to the security posture of an organization. And certainly it falls under two umbrellas, being proactive as well as reactive in cybersecurity posture. So this would kind of fit under two umbrellas, but more under the reactive piece, correct? It can be. It can be, a, it can be reactive in that it causes a, a user or an analyst to take an action, or it could be reactive in that it is doing something in the system on your behalf that you, you, know, you, could, be a, you could be aware of but it doesn't require a human to, to react to. Well, that's important, obviously. So how do you determine the value of a countermeasure, not just deciding, okay, this is what we need to happen if ABC occurs? What is the value scale of that? Sure. So most of the time when we talk about countermeasures, we talk about the fact that they generate alerts. Uh, and the word alert is actually interesting because it's a noun, it's a verb, and it's an adjective. So you can become alert as an individual through the action of an alert being something that makes you know, alerts you to this fact. But really, it's about raising awareness that there's potentially something suspicious or malicious going on uh, in your environment. And how well it performs that is to make sure that what you want to really know about is escalated to a user's or an analyst uh, you know, knowledge base and not necessarily um, overwhelming them. And, and you get what's called alert fatigue, where you're not necessarily uh, able to find what is truly suspicious or malicious in your environment because um, you just get over overwhelmed with too much information and then you're just sort of paralyzed and making decisions. Would you say that's part of educating your organization from within the organization itself, but also the customers? Sure, there's a lot of education about how to understand that sometimes things are really hard to detect and sometimes even though you can detect something, it's you don't know the intent. So tools that an administrator uses, the exact same tools that an adversary could use. And so just because something occurred on your system, you don't necessarily know what was the what was the meaning behind that. And so the more insights you can gather and you can educate your, your users to understand when you see this type of an alert, this is the other type of alert you might be looking for, other type of activity you, you are you know, you should find if it truly is malicious versus, um, you know, an intentional authorized activity that's occurring inside your network. Well, I love that you highlighted intent. And I think that's something organizations really need to focus on. Like, what is the intent of it? How are we able to follow through post that? How are the steps taken based on the intent shown? And what does it really mean? So I think that's a really important point that you covered. So thank you for that. And how do you use research to inform countermeasures for detecting threats in customers' environments? Now, that's also, I guess, a part of not just education, but research on the end of the organization, 
But again, we have to inform the countermeasures there. How do you do that for detecting threats in a customer's environment? Sure. So a lot of the research that we do around uh, detections and countermeasures, um, if it's organically or inside something that we generate ourselves, we normally take we take an adversarial approach, under type approach. And so we'll do what's called a purple team research project where we have an environment that is instrumented with our various detection capabilities. And we have intentional adversarial activity by our red team happening inside that environment so that our blue team can observe the telemetry and observe the, the information that's coming to them based off from the sensors so that we can look for you know, specific threads that we can pull through that telemetry to make very smart uh, detections and alerts for seeing that activity. And then the adversarial simulators, the red team, they will actually, when they see that they are detected, they will change their techniques in which they are uh, performing these actions to try to avoid those detections so that we can then create more detections. And so it's a cat and mouse game going back and forth, uh, just creating the, the strongest type of countermeasures that we can. Well, that's really incredible. It's really a learning process, I suppose, with the teams working almost hand in hand, not really against each other, but a learning process in order to make the best proper uh, protocol that you need to happen within organizations. So that's really neat. So what has been your biggest challenge in dealing with countermeasures? And, you know, everyone talks about stories. I've heard these stories and that stories. I know you can't mention any names of companies, but what is a really cool, interesting story that I think our audience would love to hear from you? Well, I think, you know, going back to the, the purple team kind of assessment back in December with the log for j or the log for shell vulnerability that kind of consumed a lot of our industry at the time, we we interacted in that very, we, we conducted that same interactive process of writing an exploit to see if, or to take advantage of this vulnerability that was released and then detecting it and then going back and forth um, where we detect the first version and they make a second version do us uh, continue to iterate but what we saw is a lot of scanning activity in our environment where everyone from adversaries to actually system admins to just curious researchers started just throwing this uh malicious payload that was out there across multiple networks and just generating tons and tons of noise and what we saw was that just because you receive this malicious traffic doesn't mean that your system was vulnerable to it but people would see this um these you know, the presence of the scanning activity and really be concerned about it. And so we started having to connect dots and say, well, if this malicious traffic comes in, this is the type of traffic we would see, we expect to see going out to indicate that we've been compromised. And then how can we stitch those together? Um, but it was really great. And, you know, one of our uh, partners said, you know, this is when it's helpful to have a bad guy around so that you can actually do these interactive uh, tests. Well, how important is it the act and react? You know, you're dealing with different types of attacks coming or different types of information coming your way that might look malicious. And as you talk about, there's tons of noise going on or people trying different things. Maybe parts of it could be almost um, insider threat. I'd call negligent insider threat. Somebody just not informed well enough about what they need to do if something should happen. So they kind of play around with it. How important is it communication between organizations, groups within organizations, almost the digital transformation within organizations? Well, I think what's really great is to have a place that you can experiment and you can test outside of your production environments, a range environment, a playground, a sandbox, depending on what kind of you know term you want to use, yeah. and being able to use those types of environments to test out and learn and to just be not be afraid to break things. And obviously, you wouldn't want to do that in a production environment because you don't want to break whatever type of um, service or, or utilization you have of your of your platforms, but you also don't want your security provider to have to be chasing down uh, false positives because any any time we spend activity, you know, looking at stuff that isn't malicious, steals us of the opportunity to find the real badness in in our customers' environments. Very interesting. And lastly, is there any other thoughts you'd like to share with our audience, whether it being any specific pointers, any thoughts around this topic, or any thoughts around cybersecurity on its own right from your perspective? I think, you know, as a former educator, what I'm really encouraged by is all the different learning platforms that are out there that can take you from having no knowledge to having a, in, you know, a basic understanding of cybersecurity, but then taking a very seasoned veteran and being able to to take it to the next level. And many of these things are crowdsourced, provided by the community, provided you know for free of charge. Um, and it's just a really interesting or, um, 
community to be a part of. And so I would encourage anyone out there who's just interested in any type of um, cybersecurity field to just, you know, to look on the web and find find these resources that are available to you to learn um, to learn us how to get started uh, because it does take playing around and tinkering with it yourself in order to uh, really understand the basics and to just really um, get a good foothold in this industry. Well, that's some great advice. Well, Clay, it was a pleasure speaking with you today. I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you. Thank you very much. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. Yeah, you too.